Amen. So as I've mentioned the last several weeks, we are uh, really leaving out of Proverbs and we're going to be going in some different directions. Uh, and so there's a number of weeks where we're going to be uh, tackling some different topics some different subjects uh, in between leaving Proverbs and where we're going next. And so I want to invite you this evening to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. And as you're turning there, I want to uh, read a quotation that is probably accurate. Uh, and it's from just about five, a little over 500 years ago. Martin Luther in April 1521, standing before the uh, papal diet, the, the, the council that was holding him on trial for his statements, for his writings in particular against the Roman Catholic Church, was asked and demanded for the second day in a row, what do, you, what do you have to say about all these things that you've said? Are you going to stand by all these statements? Are you going to uh, hold to them? Or are you ready to recant? Are you ready to walk those back and say, yeah, I was mistaken. I'm in error. I, I, I repudiate those things. And for the second day in a row, being pressed to give an answer, Luther's response finally under pressure because they said, listen, you need to give us a straight answer. They were afraid to give him an opportunity to speak because they knew it was disastrous for them. Just, just give us an answer. Do you, do you repudiate those things? Do you recant or not? Luther said this, unless convinced by the authority of Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. The rest of us are most familiar with, here I stand and can do no other. God help me. Amen. Luther, as a critical point in his defense of, this is why I have to stand by all, all those books and pamphlets and writings for which I'm on trial right now, a key point of that was, my conscience won't let me. I'm bound by. My conscience is captive to the word of God. How often do you think about your conscience? How often do you consider what's the role of your conscience? I think there can be a lot of confusion in regard to this particular topic. There, there can be a lot of confusion in regard to, well, especially that, that has some theological flavor to it. What, is, what does my conscience do? Is, is my conscience the same as the Holy Spirit? Is, is my conscience something that now as a believer I'm, I'm bound to? What, what, what do I do with the conscience? In Scripture like it does with everything. It's no shortage on this topic. And in particular, as we go to this season of coming out of the book of Jonah, where you have a man who clearly, before we get to the events of chapter 1, there was some calloused conscience. There was some hardness that was acceptable to him towards the Ninevites. It, throughout Jonah's response to the Lord's command to go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim that I'm going to judge it so that they'll repent. Jonah's in talents up to the end, even with that little, that, that blip from the, the belly of the great fish of, I, I've done this wrong. Even in the midst of that, there's sort of a level of acceptability of, but it's okay how I feel about them. And we get that through chapter 4 where God has to ask him, do you have a good reason to be angry? Because in Jonah's conscience, up to that point at least, had that question been asked, it would have been, well, sure. Sure. Coming out of looking at all of that through the book of Jonah, but now as we're coming into the season of Resurrection Sunday and we're considering and remembering in a unique way 
even apart from the normal regular rhythm of remembering through the celebration of the Lord's table, as we come into a season where we are brought back to and our attention is drawn into, no, 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 consider the work of the Lord and the fullness of what was accomplished in the redemption and reconciliation through the cross of Calvary and his resurrection. And these two are inseparable. We, we have to bring both of them together. And we begin to think about, and, and I would encourage you, if this has not been a part of coming into the season for you, where there hasn't been a whole lot of consideration of that, other than, oh yeah, I need to get a new set of clothes for Easter Sunday. If there hasn't been a greater consideration, I, I would encourage you, begin now to be thinking toward Oh, yeah, let, let me think about the resurrection. Let me think about the work of the cross. Let me think about what was accomplished. Because so much was accomplished. And it's easy for us to have a, a limited association with the cross of, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I received forgiveness. I, I'm spared the penalty of the just wrath of God through the cross. And I get eternal life. And we might kind of take those two or three things and say that's what happened at the cross. And God's word would say a lot more happened. A lot more was accomplished. And this evening I want to draw our attention to one of those things that God's word says was accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews, by the way, in case you're saying, okay, I do want to think well about that. I want to, I want to consider these things. I want to take the next several days, the next week and a half, and really think well through what was accomplished in the cross. I would encourage you, get in the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews is a, a, a repetitive motion of, and Jesus is better. And what Jesus did is superior. And those things that had been Jesus was the substance of what former, formerly had been a shadow. And, and look at what is purchased for us by Christ that those in the old covenant didn't enjoy the fullness of. Which is where we're going to look now in Hebrews chapter 9. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 9 in the first few verses. We're going to start in verse 1. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary. For there was the tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense. And the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna. And Aaron's rod, which budded in the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of all of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Which, by the way, has frustrated everybody who's ever studied this book. Because he just went into all of this incredible depth of stuff that, that that's chapters are devoted to in the Old Testament. And, and then he said, and we can't talk about all of that right now. But what he's about to make the point of is, again, repetitively through the book of Hebrews, but what Jesus provided is something substantially, exponentially better. Verse 6. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifice are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, there's a lot happening in this text. And to borrow from the author of Hebrews, of which we cannot speak now. There's a lot taking place that we're not going to get into this evening. But let, let me summarize a little bit of what we just looked at for the last 11 verses. 
what the author of Hebrews has just walked through is, remember the tabernacle? And he's speaking to people who, that would have been such a, a obviously rhetorical question that they're going, yeah, of course we do. Of course we remember the tabernacle, the temple, the Lord leading his people out of uh, Egypt and, and the exodus and out of, out of that uh, uh, land of slavery and into the wilderness. And then finally his successor Joshua leading them into the promised land. And on the way the Lord covenants with this people having chosen them of all the nations on the earth to make them a nation. To make them a nation of priests for himself. And he, and he establishes his presence in their midst through the tabernacle. He's going to make his presence known above the ark between the cherubim and he's going to from the holy place rule the people of Israel but his holy presence he warns the people in so many of those passages you, you can't get near me because of your unholiness because of your sinfulness because of your corruption so there's got to be layers of separation there's got to be the veil that separates the most holy place, the holy of holies, from the holy place that the priests can come in there and they can work through the, the rituals of worship. But then even outside of that, there's, there's another curtain and that's where the sacrifices are going to take place. And then beyond that, there's even uh, another barrier, another wall from just everybody wandering into the area of worship, this sanctified place where there's a respect in degrees of we can come this far but not any farther because to get closer we need to be holy as he's holy and we're not. We're not permitted to come into that presence. Even that high priest that these verses have just referred to, that high priest before he could come into that most holy place, like it said, just once a year and not without blood, he had to come having gone through an extensive process of ceremonial cleansing for his own sin for the sin of the people he had to be prepared and washed and uh, uh, animals blood had to be spilt in representation of this is my sin that's causing this death and it had to happen repeatedly because the blood of goats and calves it, it could never accomplish actual forgiveness it could never accomplish a lasting, effective atonement, a covering for sin. And one of the things that that did, because the knowledge that as the high priest went into the holy place with the blood, sprinkling it on the mercy seat, sprinkling it on the seat above the tablets that contain the law in the Ark of the Covenant, it was a reminder of here's God's standard and because it has not been kept there's got to be bloodshed. Because if, if it's not God's going to extend his wrath. He's going to execute his wrath on the people who've broken that covenant. And the priest as he goes in there and he sprinkles that blood on the top of the mercy seat one of the things that he is acutely aware of is and we'll be back next year. This isn't the last time. It's, it's going to have to be done again. And as he goes out and removes those robes that have been prepared specifically for that ceremony, and there's a waiting anticipation and anxiousness that the congregation, having attended the ceremony, as he reemerges, there's an expectation of, all right, the sacrifice has been accepted. We know that the wrath of God has been restrained for now. But next year we have to come back. Next year we, we have to be reminded that that wrath still exists. It still stands suspended over us. It's being restrained by the mercy of God. Represented in the blood of the bulls and the goats. But it's good for now, but, but not for long. But one day. One day there will be a sacrifice. It was built into the system, the temporariness of it all. Well, one of the things that stands out, even in Hebrews chapter 9 here, is this reality. They knew it's not enough. They knew that there's got to be something lasting and, and, and better to come. And one of the effects that that had, according to verse 9, 
It meant that those other sacrifices, it cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. It couldn't cleanse their conscience. It could not give them a settled sense of we're relieved. We're free. It could not settle them in their conscience. But when Christ came, verse 11, when he appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Verse 12, through his own blood. In other words, it was no longer through the shadow, through the representative elements of the tabernacle and the holy place. Instead, Christ entered into the true, actual substance of which the tabernacle was just a shadow. He entered into the presence of God and presented himself as that sacrifice, final and forever. And one of the results of that, the author of Hebrews draws our attention to. Verse 24, we'll begin there. Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to su suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Because Christ came, he could bring that cleansing of conscience. What I want us to zero in on this evening is this. All of that's background. <laughs> because Christ came, suffered, died, rose again, ascended on high to be our intercessor, to be our mediator, to be our high priest forever. In Christ, we can have a clean conscience. We can have a clean conscience. Now, I want us to think about that for just a second in terms of how those in the world would hear that statement. Those who do not have Christ, who do not have his peace, who do not have the promise of forgiveness, that's unattainable. A clean conscience, maybe for a minute. Maybe I can do something to, to dull it. Maybe I can do something to, to distract myself from it. Maybe I can do something to, to silence it somehow. But, but to actually have a clean conscience? Uh. But in Christ, that's something he purchased for his people. It's something that believers are able to have and it serves an integral part in our sanctification. This is a blood-bought benefit brought to us by Christ, and we should not neglect it. One of the great hymn writers of old Isaac Watts, in a, in a hymn titled, Not All the Blood of Beasts, I don't know why it didn't stick. It's not one of the more well-known ones. But in the first verse of this hymn, he says, Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ the heavenly lamb takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we can have a clean conscience. Our clean conscience is connected to our service across the pages of Scripture. We're going to look at some of that this evening. And lack of a clean conscience prohibits effective, continual service to the Lord. One pastor has said this, the conscience may be the most underappreciated and least understood attribute of humanity. 
So let's, let's talk about some misunderstandings concerning the conscience. <clears throat> Sometimes, and I remember hearing this in, at different times growing up within churches, Sometimes we, we can hear that the conscience is just for unbelievers. The conscience is just for unbelievers, but now as a believer, you, you don't need the conscience. But, but that's not correct. That flies in the face of so much that the Apostle Paul is going to say about his own conscience and his relationship with it. it we, we don't have the conscience as, well, that's for unbelievers, but now as a believer, you, you don't need your conscience, you don't listen to it. That's a scary place. If you have embraced that, if you have tried to live according to that, of like, yeah, my conscience isn't something I need to pay attention to. No, 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 it's, it's not infallible, but it is a benefit. It is an ally. Uh, another misunderstanding that can happen is is that our conscience is kind of the final word. Is that, listen, if it, it, my conscience says this, your conscience might be wrong. And that's something we're going to look at as well. Your conscience might be wrong. And biblically, there's several categories for what that looks like. It could be weak. It could be sensitive. It could be seared. So despite what singing crickets might have said, you should not let your conscience be your guide. There's a reality here where we need to have all of our thoughts about ourselves molded, directed, as Martin Luther said, held captive by God's word. Listen, there's a clear distinction in scripture that we're commanded to keep a clear conscience. We're to have a peace within our conscience that's free from wrongdoing. That's something to labor for. That doesn't mean that there's no, there's nothing there to accuse us. Not that there's no sin, just that there's no active accusation. One of the phrases that we've heard often as we've been walking through the topic of repentance, especially through the book of Jonah, has been this idea of keeping a short receipt keeping a short relationship with, you know, I've, I've recognized that there's sin. Maybe it has been part of our conscience accusing us. Now what are we doing about it? Are we laboring to have a clean conscience? Because in the blood of Christ we can. So if we have walked through and are walking through repentance, are we looking for and laboring for a clean conscience? Because another aspect of this that is one of those things that can be misunderstood or warped or twisted apart from God's word is that, no, 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 I need, to, I need to have an afflicted conscience all the time. No. Sometimes that, that's taken as sort of a, a, a twisted form of spirituality is that like, it, as long as you feel guilty. <laughs> no. No, it's bad. Now, if you're pursuing sin and you don't feel guilty, that's a problem. That's a seared conscience. That's a, that's a desensitized conscience. But there is a recognition of if you're a believer and you're walking in righteousness and repentance, you should be able to say, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying a clean conscience. And one of the traps that we can fall into with that warped sense of, no, like I, I need to just, I need to feel bad about my sin. Yes, and feeling bad does not atone. I want to I wanna sit on that one for just a second because I think sometimes we can get so hung up on this that in the process of repentance, we can say, I need to feel worse about this. We need to feel the weight of our sin, and we need to feel the relief of the sufficient work of Christ. And one of those is infinitely greater than the other. If we're trying to, whether we recognize it or not, if we're trying to self-atone through staying afflicted in the conscience, I need to feel bad about that still. I know that I've, I know that I've trusted in the Lord for that, and I know that he's covered it, but I, I just I want to carry that like, sadness about it around a little bit more. For what? Was his suffering not enough? We can enjoy a clean conscience. So, just to take a little bit of a deeper look at this. How important is the conscience in God's word? Well, it's used or referenced about 30 times in the New Testament. And Paul speaks of it really almost constantly. Twice in the book of Acts. I'm going to go through these very, very quickly. If you, if you want the references of these, I can give them to you later. But I want to... 
I've spent a lot of time at the beginning, but now I've got to I've got to run at this point. And twice in the book of Acts, he he testified about himself. I've got a clean conscience in regard to the things that I'm proclaiming. He, he says that in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1 and chapter 24 and verse 16 as he's testifying about his own standing. As he's testifying about the, legi the legitimacy of the message that he proclaims, he says, I stand here today with a clean conscience, which by the way, he's often saying that in the presence of those who are the religious leaders who are still trusting in those old sacrifices, that are still trusting in those ways that Hebrews just said Christ came and was superior to, that must have held them aghast, that they would have stood there. As he says, I'm, I'm standing here with a clean conscience. Can you imagine as they're saying, well, we have so many months until the Day of Atonement again, how they would have gone, well, what does he mean? He's got a clean conscience. But it's something that he continually is going to reference. He says, I'm free from a guilty conscience. There's nothing accusing me of wrongdoing in these things. And he offers this as a defense to the accusations brought by the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. Just marching through the epistles of Paul, he mentions the conscience several times. And the last time he does is when he exhorts us to be in subjection to rulers for the sake of our conscience. Some of the time, I'll, I'll have us turn to some of these in just a few minutes in 1 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, he says our confidence is in a clear conscience in regard to the way that he labored. As he's making a defense of the ministry that he had, he says, I've got a clean conscience for the way that we came and proclaimed the gospel to you. Two more times in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 5, verse 11, he, he's going to appeal to the conscience of his hearers and say, don't you agree that we've labored in holiness? Doesn't your conscience inform you that we have labored in such a way as to be free of accusation? In his epistles to Timothy, Paul reminds him that the goal of our instruction is love from a good conscience and then reminds Timothy himself to keep his conscience clean. Because, in particular, in cr contrast to that, the false teachers, they have seared their conscience, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. By the way, he makes the same statement in his epistle to Titus when he talks about the false teachers are those who have, have, have silenced their conscience towards the falsehood and the, and the unrighteousness that they're pursuing. He even reminds them that equality for deacons is that they hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. In other words, there's not these persistent accusations that they're lying in the truth as they proclaim the message nagging at them of, you don't, you don't really believe that. He says you need to hold the mystery of the faith. If you're going to serve as a deacon, you need to hold the mystery of the faith with a clean conscience of, no, I'm convinced of these things, and I hold to it myself. So even as I serve and labor in these things, I, I have not a legitimate accusation that has uh, afflicted my conscience of, you know, but, but I don't actually I don't actually think that. I don't actually buy that myself. That's one of the qualities of those who serve the body of Christ. Second Timothy, Paul is going to testify that he serves God with a clear conscience. Again and again and again, these references to Paul and his conscience are connected to his service. It's an essential part of his witness. His clear conscience enables him to effectively serve. Now, the word that's used throughout the New Testament for the conscience is, is a word that means to, to bear witness alongside. Now, we've got to deal with what is, what is the conscience? What, what, what is it actually? Because it, it's not an organ. It's not a, a thing that we can pinpoint and say, my conscience lives here or, or something like that. So we need to deal with, okay, what, what actually is the conscience? The conscience is... The other in you that knows. I, I can't remember and I haven't been able to pinpoint where I found that definition, but I think it's one of the better ones. Your conscience is the witness within you that knows. It's that testimony that comes alongside as an ally to the truth that bears witness alongside you. Kevin DeYoung, a pastor, defines it as what aids us in acquiring knowledge, in particular knowledge and understanding in ethical and moral matters. 
a Puritan pastor, John Flavel, says, the conscience is God's spy and man's overseer. As I said, the conscience is an ally to the truth. It's a witness to the truth within that's testifying to, no, that's wrong, or yes, that's right. And the conscience is supposed to be an ally to the truth. And as we've already mentioned, it can be wrong. In Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through 15, Paul writes that the conscience is an advocate where there is no law. It alternately accuses or defends us. There's something within us indicating you shouldn't do this. This is evident. It's one of the clearest ways that, that, that I think I've seen this operate just at different levels of maturity. When you see the child who is hiding their hand behind their back immediately, you've got this awareness. What have you done? You have this recognition something has gone amiss. At least in their mind. At least according to their conscience, there's a reality of, I should not have done this. I need to hide this. I need to conceal this. Why? Because their little conscience is accusing them. They're seeking relief from a witness within that's going, oh, this shouldn't be. And the conscience is a gift from the Lord. And like I mentioned, it's not an infallible one. Our conscience is not the truth itself. Now, 1 Corinthians 8 deals with this in full. We don't have time this evening to go into all of it, but I want to encourage you, 1 Corinthians 8 is going to deal with this a lot. But your conscience can be wrong. Your conscience can be wrong. And that takes us to a very important part of examining the conscience. So I do want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to look at just a few things in there. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And I want us to have this awareness as we turn there. Your conscience can be trained. Your conscience can be trained. One author has said, as we come to understand God's revealed will more and more, we will have the opportunities to add rules to our conscience that God's word clearly teaches and weed out rules that God's word treats as optional. In other words, we can have a conscience that's misinformed. We, we can have a conscience that is wrong. It's not truth itself. We can have a conscience that is, well, I've just always thought that was wrong. But as we open God's word and as we get to know it and as we get to see his word revealed, his truth presented to us, we can have that corrected of, I always thought that was wrong, but God's word actually says this about it. Or, I always thought that was okay, but then I got into God's word and I, I was convinced of this by it. God's word is to be the tuning fork of our conscience. God's word is to be the, the, the standard by which our conscience is weighed and informed. Which means that we need to maintain a teachable conscience. We need to maintain a teachable conscience, a conscience that's informed, listen, this is so critical, by the word. By the word of God. Not by, now I used to think this was wrong, but then, you know, just I had a lot of people. They just said some really compelling things. That's not a helpful influence on your conscience. Instead, our conscience needs to be held captive by God's word. Where we would say, I, I'm weeding this out. I'm struggling. I've got a burden in my conscience about this. So what are you doing about it? Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm reading a lot about it. Where? <laughs> really important. I'm talking to a lot of people about it. I'm trying to get kind of a consensus. Dangerous. You need to maintain a teachable conscience that's subject to God's word. But here's the deal. This is, this is a thing that I think sometimes we can have a unrighteous impatience with. I'm struggling with this. I'm not settled in my conscience about it. 
and so I'm just kind of letting it lie. There's a time for that. But there can be a, you know, I'm just not settled in my conscience about it, and so I'm just going with what I feel. Don't. That's terrible. It's terrible. To have this idea of, yeah, I'm, I'm going to ignore where my conscience is burdened, and, and I'm just going to kind of go with whatever feels right in the moment. Because what we're doing in that practice is resisting our conscience. Where, you know, I, that doesn't sit well with my conscience, but I'm just, I'm kind of going one way or the other with it right now. It's dangerous because then we're becoming accustomed to ignoring, pushing off, resisting, deadening the influence of our conscience. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, let's look at verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge. But some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Now, we've parachuted into this chapter. So just a little bit of background of what's going on. <clears throat> In this chapter, there's an issue that's taking place that does have a right or wrong activity involved in it. There is a right answer and a wrong answer to it. People are concerned with, should I eat meat that's been offered to this idol or not? Now, other places in God's word are going to deal with and characterize that one group in this is wrong in their understanding of whether or not they can. But in 1 Corinthians 8, that's not what he's going to deal with as clearly. Instead, what he's going to say is, not everybody has the full knowledge of how they should function in regard. They, not everybody has the knowledge of, is this right, actually, according to God's word, or is it not? But in the meantime, their conscience is affected by it. Verse 7, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. In other words, he says, their conscience is saying don't. All of their past experience has not been cultivated by the truth of God's word about this topic. And therefore, as they defy their conscience, it's being defiled. They're walking in a way that is soiling their conscience. Their conscience is accusing them. They're going forward in something that their conscience isn't okay with. And Paul says, that's bad. Don't do that. Let's continue reading. Verse 10. For if someone sees you, you who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he's weak, one of those weak conscienced people, will they not be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? Verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined for the brother whose sake Christ died. Now understand. This is really important because we've just crossed into how does your relationship with your conscience affect other people? Because your conscience isn't just about you. Your conscience has an effect on others. There's a person who can, because they don't have a weak conscience, they have had their conscience informed by God's word, their conscience has been uh, uh, shaped according to the truth, their conscience is fine. But their freedom in exercising that my conscience isn't burdened by this is having a detrimental effect, a destructive effect on the one who is weak. The one who is weak, seeing this happen, is ruined by the exercise of your freedom and conscience. Now, a couple different things are on display here. First of all, your conscience can be defiled. A continual practice of resisting the voice of your conscience can lead to it being defiled. It can be uh, soiled in such a way that you're going, I, I don't know if I can trust it. It's so afflicted. It's so, so accusing that I just can't get past this. 
And the same language is used in Titus chapter 1, but in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, we're warned that a conscience can be seared. Because it's dangerous to train our conscience to be silent. When someone is continually sil silencing or ignoring their conscience, they're searing it. They're deadening its effect on themselves. This is why it's important for us to train it to godliness according to truth and not ignore it outright. And, and why we don't want to override the conscience of a brother. That's what's taking place here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. There's this idea of, well, I'm free to do it. I don't care about them. In that, we have just displayed a lack of love for our brother. And look at the way that's characterized in verse 11, what we just read. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. And, and then in case that doesn't strike you significantly enough, that brother who Christ died for. Our freedom is never to be used in the abuse of a brother. The freedom of conscience that we might enjoy does not mean I get to do what I want and they need to grow up. Now, that's where our selfishness can begin to show. Well, why do I need to restrain my free conscience for this brother who's weak? Well, because the Bible tells us that those who are strong are to bear the burdens of the weak. Explicitly, it says that. Which means that, a couple things. There can be this misunderstanding of, well, the weak brother needs to set the temperature for everybody else. That's not necessarily the case. But there is a recognition of, is my freedom really worth destroying them in the process? The other side of this is, we need to recognize what does it mean to have the weaker conscience brother? Does that mean, oh man, we just want to make sure and we don't, we don't hurt anybody with this. There's a recognition of we want to be cautious, we want to be careful, we want to be loving in these things, and what does it mean for them to be ruined? This could be the defiling, the soiling of their conscience. But this is distinct from they'd be upset by it. That's not what's in view here. And, and, and I know one of the misunderstandings that can be associated with this is, well, that person, their conscience can't handle that. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, here in the text, what that looks like is they're going to be emboldened to ignore their conscience, silence their conscience, and do whatever they saw you doing in your freedom, which to them, it would be sin. Why? Because they're violating their conscience. So in that, it's not a, well, they would be upset by it. They would be, a, they would be, like, they don't agree with that. That's not what's in view here. What's in view here is they would be emboldened to sin, and that would be damaging, destructive to their conscience. That would be destructive to the ally of truth that the Lord has placed within them. One pastor, Andy Nasali, has said, whenever obey conscience collides with obey God, obey God must come out on top every time. Here's the deal. How do we do this then? We have to consider others as more valuable than ourselves. We have to consider others highly. The very next verse here, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, tells us this. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. How seriously do we take the conscience? Remember, one of the first questions that I asked this evening is, how often do we think about our conscience? Whenever we engage with other brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be considering our conscience. We ought to be considering, am I, am I sinning against them with all of the freedom that I enjoy? Or, or am I, and here's the deal, am I bearing their burden? There is a recognition of, I mean, they're weak. So what do we do with them? We want to strengthen them. We want to encourage them. We want to direct them towards, and here's what scripture says about this, but why? This can be one of those real fun areas. Well, I, don't want them to be <clears throat> I don't want them to be weak conscienced anymore. Why? Well, because then I can do what I want, and they, they won't be ruined by it. That's not, that's you loving yourself. That's not you loving them. 
if it's a, no, I want them to be strengthened in their conscience because I want them to recognize the freedom that has been purchased from them. They're no longer a slave to that tradition of idolatry that they were formerly a part of. I want them to see the, the, the grace of the Lord in this. Now, here's the deal. We can be really tricky with ourselves and be like, no, I have really great motives in wanting them to you know, see all the freedom that's in Christ. It's theirs. It's just, it's just about them. Which, again, is why this takes place within a congregation. This takes place within a body. This takes place within, recognize you might be sinning against Christ if you don't do this well. This is to bring that sobering element. This is to bring that element of, how's my conscience in this? Am I able to do this? I think the Apostle Paul would exhort us with this. Am I able to do this with a clean conscience? Am I living only for myself? Or am I living with a clean conscience and with a consciousness, two totally different things, of my brother's conscience? Am I living with an awareness of, well, I need to serve and love my brother? Flip over with me just a page or two, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. That word shows up so frequently in this section of chapters in 1 Corinthians because Paul is going to make this statement, even in this text, that everything should be done for edification. That all of our actions and activities and the things in which we partake in or not ought to be done for the sake of building up in Christ. Verse 24. Let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that's sold in the market, meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience's sake. I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all of the glory of God. <clears throat> I, I'm afraid sometimes we can take that verse and sort of diver, uh, divorce it from our, the context and say, yeah, all of life is to be the glory of God. Look at what that's talking about. In its specific context, that's saying, be careful what you're doing for the sake of, not just loving and serving yourself, but for the sake of others. And your love of the Lord and a desire to have him glorified is the thing that propels and shapes and constrains all of that. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. <laughs> Paul's dealing specifically with the conscience here, and he makes reference not just to his own conscience, but especially in verse 29, to the conscience of another. He even anticipates the question and asks, why, why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? What's amazing is I've, I've had people like ask that as we walk through this, dealing with, like, but, well, why do I have to be constrained by that other person? I mean, God's word said. Because that's a brother for whom Christ died. Uh, do we have another place to go for that? Like, do we, do we need a higher reason? Because we're not to do damage to the conscience of another. Because we're to do all things for edification. We can have a weak, seared, defiled, and like we saw... We can have a conscience that wounds another and in the process sin against Christ. And with the few minutes that we have left, I want to I direct our attention back to where we started. The conscience can be cleansed. It can be clear. It can be good in that it doesn't accuse we can have a conscience that's not witnessing against us because of what's been done in Christ. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 9. 
Hebrews chapter 9. I want to I look at just a handful of verses here and then moving into chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9, let's look back at verse 9. Excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. The gifts and sacrifice were offered that cannot make the worshiper clean in conscience. Verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In other words, one of the things that was accomplished through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ was a cleansing of the conscience. Which means that as we labor in righteousness and as we labor in repentance, our conscience can be cleansed because of what Christ did, because our sin has been atoned for by him. That doesn't, and this is so often where even, even heretical offshoots of Christianity have, have taken away and said, well, that just means that if you say something like that, people are going to feel like they can sin with abandon. And they're going to abuse the grace of God. And Paul, actually, he interacts with that. In Romans chapter 6, when he says, what then? Should we sin that grace should abound? And he answers that uh, uh, resoundingly. No, may it never be. Instead, we're constrained by that love of Christ. We're, we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're slaves to Christ. And when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Exactly what Hebrews is talking about. The one who serves as our mediator for that cleansed conscience. Jumping over to chapter 10, look with me at verse 1. For the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of the things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. It could never accomplish righteousness. It was never designed to. It was fading away. Verse 2, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had a consciousness of sin. Now, that verse, or that word in verse 2, consciousness and awareness of sin, that actually is our word of conscious, consciousness. It, it would have afflicted the conscious, conscience. This is tough, listen. <laughs> Enunciate. <laughs> One of the failures of the Old Covenant was that it could never provide a freedom in the conscience to the burden of sin. And one of the benefits, the blessings of the New Covenant, the better covenant, the last covenant, is that Christ in his death and resurrection provides that cleansing of conscience. Look with me at verse 22. Now let's back up. This, these are all amazing verses. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This clean conscience is part of the basis on which we can draw near with confidence, enjoying our relationship with the Lord because of the confidence of our sins being washed away. The warning follows on from here in the remaining verse of the chapter, so we have need of perseverance. We need to continually walk forward in sanctification. We need to labor for a clean conscience. Remembering, being brought back to Christ took care of this. Christ has cleansed me from this. One of the driving factors in pursuing righteousness can be a clean conscience. The more of God's word you know, the more you'll become aware of your own sinfulness. But that's where for the believer you have this basis of a clean conscience to return to. You have a confidence that the sin... The, the sin that you are afflicted with, having recognized it, having seen it, and then laboring to repent of it, you can have an assured confidence that sin has been dealt with. 
and confidence is in Christ. I can dwell in enjoying one of Christ's gifts to me, a clean conscience, or I can live with a defiled conscience and the dissatisfaction of sin. Conversely, for the unbeliever, the conscience can be terrifically burdening, which points to the refuge that's in Christ. One of the things that I hear so often is, is <clears throat> well, you know, I, I don't want to make people feel bad. Then why would they run to the rock that is Christ? I don't, I don't want to make them feel bad about their sin. If their conscience is not afflicted, if they're not being convicted of sin, if there's not a recognition of, I, I'm defiled, then they'll never go for cleansing. We can preach the unburdening of the conscience in Christ. For the believer, we have an ally in the con conscience in evangelism. We can appeal to the conscience by the Spirit speaking into it through the Word. And there's a lot that we're leaving on the table here. There's a lot that we're not getting into this evening. But one of the things I would draw your attention to to conclude, turn with me just a few pages from where you are, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. One of the exhortations that Peter is going to make in this epistle is this <clears throat> recognition, this exhortation to bear suffering well with a good testimony for the sake of a clean conscience. He's going to continually be hitting these notes as he reminds of the redemption that is ours in Christ, beginning back in verse 17. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's works, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. He's going to strike a similar note in chapter 2 <clears throat> and verse 19. As he encourages and commands, bear the suffering that accompanies walking in righteousness well. Do it well because, chapter 2 verse 19, this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. In the next chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, he's going to hit this note again. Keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Finally, Hebrews chapter 13, you don't have to turn there. But in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, one of the final words of the author of Hebrews is to say, pray that we may have a clean conscience. So, beloved, how's your conscience? Are you enjoying fellowship with God on the basis of the forgiveness of sins? If your conscience is afflicted this evening, is it aligned with God's word? If it's aligned with God's word and your conscience is accusing you, then what's in order is repentance. It's repentance. It might be the initial repentance of turning to Christ in salvation, or it might be repentance of I have not been walking as a child of God. And that repentance l means looking to Christ who atoned for all our sin. It could be sinning against Christ by wounding the conscience of another. Or we could be living to edify them for Christ's sake. My desire would be if, if you name Christ this evening, that you would enjoy what has been bought by the precious blood of Christ, a clean conscience. Let me pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise your name that you have paid such a dear price for us, for 
your namesake. And Lord, as we consider this difficult and intricate topic, as we consider these things, Lord, we ask that your name would be magnified. That as we dwell on them and, and seek to have a conscience that's cleansed and to live in a way that is according to your word and rejoicing in the good gifts that you have provided in the death of your son, we ask that we'd be strengthened for this work. And we pray this in the name of your son. Amen.